being alive during the wonder of, uh, you know, the, the first sparks of silicon sentience uh, is a remarkable moment to live in, in history and to live through in history. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you, dear listener, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash midlife. The link is in the show notes, so you can get started listening today to an audiobook that will help you turn your entrepreneurial ideas into reality. Hello, fellow midlife entrepreneurs. This is Kevin Boyd, business coach, entrepreneur, and all-round psychology nerd, bringing you interviews with people on the same entrepreneurial journey as yourself, hoping to inspire you to change your thinking, take action, and bring your vision to the world. In this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs podcast, we meet Sinjin Smith, founder of tech startup Quick Class, and we delve into everything from the pros and cons of going to film school and how the best investment he ever made was in 73 sessions of Gestalt therapy. And finally, we explore how artificial intelligence will fundamentally change all our lives. Uh, today I'm interviewing Sinjin Smith. So yes, I run something, Kevin, called Quick Class, yeah. which is a cloud-based, very app-centric learning management system platform for SME training organizations. And we work with them and we provide them a turnkey solution to their M-learning and E-learning uh, conundrums and, and pain points and issues and challenges they face in getting what they do already brilliantly well in the classroom to that student in Beijing who also wants to experience something of their knowledge and their wisdom but can't possibly come to London and go to a classroom for a few weeks. So how did this, how did your business come about? It, it evolved from a, a film festival that I ran for a decade in 15 countries around the world called Quick Flick, which uh, started in a shoebox apartments in Manhattan in 2001 when a group of us got together post-film school. And I'd gone to New York Film Academy the previous year where uh, in four or five months I'd sort of learned the basics of filmmaking. And before that I'd... I'd been a corporate monkey in Unilever for, uh, for five years. Yeah. Unilever, how was that? Times. It was a uh, certain foundation for many things, and it gave me an amazing experience in, uh, of, of sending me to New York after a couple of years. That was an amazing opportunity. And, you know, going from Warrington to Bedford to Manhattan, there was some acceleration <laughs> there. That was the typical, that was the yes. proper hockey stick, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and put it out on a graph. And uh, so, yeah, but once in Manhattan, I think I realized that I didn't want to be a Right. Uh, by my mid forties, and so you went uh, to film school. Went to film school, obvious choice. Yes, to really worry your parents at that moment in time. <laughs> you really want to, yeah, yeah. What was the thing that the, the worst thing a man can do to his parents is to tell them, "I'm going to become an artist." Ah, yeah. So I didn't necessarily know I wanted to be an artist, but I, I'd fallen in love with film with my first DV camera I bought in '98 and taught myself to edit on a you know Pentium two desk wow. you know, tower it's coming back yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. it was great it was great and it was just opened a whole new world so that was my passion growing at night from almost when I arrived in New York and uh, and then so so did it the honour of going to film school learnt all the bits and pieces in between you know storyboarding and three way lighting and working with actors and um, and then and then started a little production house with a guy called John from uh, from New Orleans and we was, ended up working with the same corporate monkeys we've been trying to escape from oh. uh, in the end anyway because you know ultimately consumer research videos somehow were paying the bills and uh, mm. but at night time uh, we we were gathering in our shoebox apartments and decided that we wanted to encourage one another in a group of about ten of us uh, who wanted to meet monthly with the short film that we'd all individually made up to about three minutes long on a common theme like stairwell or nudity or metamorphosis fragile or cocktails so we choose a theme and then we give ourselves a month to go away and uh, we call ourselves quick flick mm. and, uh, and I took that idea to Sao Paulo Brazil where I moved the following year in 2002 chase love to the tropics uh, where at a production house named Trattoria de Frame, they, uh, they adopted me as like the gringo, the in-house gringo, and wasn't quite sure what the hell I was doing there, but they were lovely. And I did a lot of post-production, uh, lots of After Effects stuff with them, uh, but also learned Portuguese 
and they and they learned a little bit of English and in return, and uh, and whilst there, their assistant uh, editors and I were talking about this thing we'd started in New York called Quick Flick, and they thought that sounds really cool. Ooh. So we thought, well, why don't we start? A, we'll start a group here. Why not? You know, so a few of us got together. That was February two thousand three, I guess, and uh, and it it was amazing what they did with it because they were super talented young filmmakers, and they really had, you know. Uh, just being a gringo at that moment in Brazil, it was something like I, I was given mm. far more credit than I deserved. So they right. thought I knew what I was talking about, despite <laughs> the fact that none of us really know what we're talking about. Right. And yes. uh, but but they but they we all got swept away with it. And by July, we were having these public screening parties where we'd have we'd invite about two hundred of our friends, have a nice DJ between the sets, and uh, and we started evolving it as very much a public exhibition. Where we would, you know, invite young filmmakers from the city to come along, and we start with a showcase of the previous month's themes, uh, best films from the previous month theme from around the world. So we started mixing the films from New York and Sao Paulo and making sort of a glo- uh, an international quote unquote showcase, which right. they loved as well. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have a theme like maritime, either maritime or maybe it was hair, which is a bit of an odd one. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, and 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 it continued from there, and the penny dropped really once we started. You know, sharing between New York and Sao Paulo, it was like, well, what if what if we could do this in a dozen cities around the world? You know, what if you could start this in the creative capitals? Suddenly, you know, created its own momentum. Yeah, and gone viral, I suppose, in some way. You know, yeah, because yeah. when people start hearing about something, and it becomes interesting enough for them to go, well, let's do this here now. And we had over four hundred screening parties over the course of a decade, and about forty thousand people came. And we inspired over 2,000 films to be created on 73 themes. So we had a, like a little grassroot, you know, underground movement of creativity. And the whole the concept was all about uh, advancing tolerance and uh, cultural understanding by yeah. inspiring and debuting the best global filmmaking talent. Mm. So that was the, that was the uh, the undercurrent of it all. Now after doing it for 10 years and it, you know and, and working on other people's projects and other people's companies to more or less help support the thing, uh, it just got tires, tiring in its own, you know, its own steam. It Is that still running Quick Flick? Is it still no, it's not. It's on hiatus. Oh, okay. Until its successor, which is uh, Quick Class, which is this LMS that's grown out of, first of all, trying to inject Quick Flick into school. So the idea was to say, hey, you know, this would be a great extracurricular activity. Yeah. But, then it, but then we started talking to teachers, and teachers were like, well, you know, your festival sounds really cool. Congratulations, but... Um, We've got some exams in our students at the class, yeah. and yeah, yeah. you know, and ultimately, uh, what they were most interested in, the aspect of it that they were most interested in, was uh, was the, were the apps that we were describing, how we would, you know, do blah blah voting for national winners, etc., etc., et how yeah. these ideas, but uh, but they were most interested in the apps for actually sharing their reference films and their students' films, you know, amongst their students in the classrooms. Yeah. So I started working with BFI, and it grew into Quick Class, uh, you know, to to create supportive. Um, you know, mobile learning platforms for students, in particular film and media. Right. And, uh, and they really incubated us through um, over a number of years. And we started, you know, doing work as well with Raindance, as you know, our friend Elliot. And, uh, and but then uh, about a year ago, I guess, Quick Class pivoted because, you know, film and media teachers, you know, at GCSE and A-level ultimately don't have the agency, the time or the uh, budgets to choose their own LMSs. But there are a lot of training organizations out there that do. So it's about being able to provide very specialized and customized things. It's funny how these things evolve Ooh. and grow, isn't it? What a weird journey from Unilever, from Warrington to, uh, to Brighton via New York, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Madrid, Barcelona, and London. Wow, that's very impressive. There you, you are. Know. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're very weird, I think, would probably be a better way of... So what do you think you, you've learned from all of that experience then, those, those 10 years of creating those films and being in different parts of the world? What have you taken I, from that? Yes, be bold. Be bold, Be yeah. bold, yeah. I think, from, you know, from, you never regret, ultimately. Even if something turns out or you, you think, what have I got myself into now? It's just, you know, who dares wins, I guess, Ooh. in a way. You Ooh. know, you're never going to... You know, not even trying means you, you're definitely going to fail. Yes. Yeah. So yes. it's about, I guess, from from all of that, is that nothing, I, none of it ever came close to killing me, and so <laughs> far has given me 
such a, an encyclopedia of amazing memories. Mm. You know, so I, I feel extremely blessed to have just thought, well, what the hell? I think the nice thing about working for Unilever and being and, and being in these you know these corporate environments was you really got a sense of, or like the beginnings of a sense of, well, if, this, if my soul is here for whatever reason, is it going to be fulfilled in these hallways, at the, you know, in these meetings, mm. you know, up and down these these lifts, in these you know lovely suites, you know, lovely hotels in this city or that city, and you know, great expense account meals, etc. But you're talking with people you're not necessarily choosing to have dinner with, yeah. but that you're sort of obliged to have dinner with. Well, my next question is, um, what motivates you every day to keep going as an entrepreneur? I think fear of failure probably is number one. You know, like, oh, Christ, you know, do I want to go back to those halls of corporate dullness? And, you yeah. know, hey, I don't want to talk you down, but I, go, I know it's not me. And I'm probably more or less unemployable at this stage. <laughs> but, I, but I'm always open to collaboration, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, uh, so I think it's just the desire, first and foremost, to maintain that freedom, maintain the to freedom, be able yeah. to um, to be able to you know decide what what is it I'm going to do today rather yeah. than being told what I'm going to do today. So I think that's probably um, the primary motivator, and then just the will to be able to bring a, you know really smart, uh, interesting people together on some sort of common mission or, or purpose that we can all get some pleasure out of doing as well. Mm. So, you know, that's probably the second thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's the teams you build and the possibilities you build together and that sense of, you know, common ownership of a number of issues together and how we all collaborate because it's too big a task for just one of us to do on our sure. own. Yeah. So we're all, gonna, we're all gonna chip in here. We're all gonna, you know, get our hands dirty. My, my next question was going to be, when you think of the word successful, yeah. um, who's the first person that comes to mind? I, I, you know, I would always go back to Gandhi, just because, I, you know, I, despite he had some strange personal you know, things, and especially with misogyny and uh, you know, odd, but he lives, in, he lives in different times. And I think that ultimately his form of protest um, and his, the way that ultimately he is the one who you know, unshackled the... Uh, you know, the lives of hundreds of millions of Indians and Pakistanis, mm. uh, he was probably, the, you know, probably had the most impact of one person, you know, on mm. people who are still alive today. A positive impact, that is, positive mm. impact. So if you could um, impart one piece of wisdom to the world, yeah. what would it be? Just take a couple of minutes, it's about gratitude, and it's just taking a couple of minutes every day to stop and just to spend a moment in wonder at the fact that we're here at all, you know, in, in absolute wonder of the, the unlikeliness of having been born at this, a remarkable moment on a remarkable, you know, tiny dot in this crazy universe. And this spark of self-knowledge and self-feeling of being part of it and just existing as part of it all is, uh, is just something really amazing to focus on. And I think that Maybe a lot of the small stuff which upsets us and worries us um, can be, um, it can be all, it can be devouring. And I think that, you know, we, if we can rise above that, we can have a lot more patience with each other. Mm. We can have a lot more, and we can have maybe a lot more consideration for the future of our species and the possibility that society will be able to exist in any sort of form in a hundred years. So what keeps you healthy? Ooh. Well, now, now you ask. Well, it's to do with sleep, food, and exercise. So, you know, I don't luckily need eight hours of sleep. I can get by with definitely five or six. And the, uh, the eating bit, hey, you know, if you can cut down on... You know, this is a great fact. 100 grams of beef. How many... How much carbon dioxide is released to produce 100 grams of beef, Kevin? I'm going to guess one tonne. 105 kilograms, so it's a thousand times the weight, so you were in the right, you know, you're thinking about a thousand and, yeah, 105 kilograms. So, you know, my plea to the world, so my, my, my bit of wisdom is about, is about acknowledging the remarkableness of this, this is even happening in the first place, but my plea to the world is, for God's sake, please just try to cut down on the meat, you know. It doesn't have to be overnight, it can be a slow withdrawal, because, yeah, you're like any, any addiction, we've just got to come down slowly, and, uh, but... Definitely um, the meat thing. 
we, there's so much, there's so much great nutrition out there. There's so many options. There's so many amazingly beautiful vegan recipes, vegetarian recipes. However you want to do it, you know, just having that consideration would have a huge impact on us all. You know, massive. So that's the food side. Obviously, try to eat stuff that has just been picked or just been pulled out of the ground if you can, without all the packaging and stuff you can, you know, get your hands on, and uh, and cook it yourself. I love to cook. Um, usually, usually it's a joint effort as well. Mm. There's nothing like about the sociability of cooking with your partner. Love it. Yeah. And the exercise, uh, you know, start with my half an hour yoga session every morning, which is a combination of you know sun salutations and bits of um, aerobic uh, push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and you know all the side stretches and all this. And it's just a really nice routine that I can do without even thinking now. Mm. But you know, half an hour a day, I think, is actually far. It's, it's like the optimum. Mm. There's lots of things you could do once a day. I think it's sort of in the optimum rhythm with your. And then, as as we as you saw me coming up your hill, or rather, you saw me coming to your front door slightly out of breath. I'm a I'm an avid Bromptoner, so uh, <laughs> so the cycling is a big yeah. part of my life, definitely yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, did that answer your question? It does. Yeah. It sounds like you're very healthy. You look very healthy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's all that preservation beyond a certain point, isn't it? Yes. You know well, yeah, once you cross 30, it's just like... <laughs> yeah, yeah it's downhill. This. It's basically downhill. <laughs> it's how quick, uh, how slowly you can, how, how effectively you can slow the decline. Yeah. So it's about hopefully, um, yeah, making it to 80, I reckon. Everything, anything past 80 is a, is a bonus. But then the closer you get to 80, of course, the more you think, well, actually, 90 wouldn't be you know, outside the realms of possibility, would yeah. it? So I guess by the time I'm 70, I'll be, look, I'll be aiming for 100 yeah. and hopefully um, still doing my yoga in the morning. What is something you believe that other people think is insane? 2016 was a dark year, wasn't it? With the uh, June 24th decision by a, okay. a, a slender majority yeah, who voted with misinformation to imagine that leaving the European Union was in any way a good idea. And I feel as though it was a combination of the greedy, the angry, and the persistently misled who caused this Mm. abhorrent collective decision which has paralyzed our politics and will probably create disruption for the next generation and it's just uh, it's a very very sad thing to see and across the atlantic of course we have more the weather than the climate but uh you know the aberration of donald d trump is uh you know just something which amazes and saddens and angers me on a daily basis because i'm a big Mm. I'm a big uh, junkie of American politics. But we don't have to get too much into American politics. But uh, crazy ideas from some people. I think it's not so much it's the ideas, it's the laziness with which some people adopt you know, ideas which they, maybe if they just explored a bit more closely, would be revealed to be you know, uh, awful. Uh, I have a theory about American presidents that goes, uh, you have a clever one and then you have a stupid one and then you have a clever <laughs> one and then a stupid one. So right. uh, how I feel about Trump is like, well, we, we've got the stupid one at the moment, yeah. but uh, just think what well, the, the next one we're going to have is going to be uh, hopefully really clever. Because I think in a way he's, he's got a lot of people motivated to come into politics. I like this, uh, you know, Pete, Pete Bettenrug or whatever his name is, Better, better Doug, Better Doug. Or he's just, uh, yeah, it's a problem. He's got a, a, a potential branding problem. But I think as soon as you can say his last name, it's a, bit, it's a little bit like um, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> yes. you know? Once you can say that, then you, yes. can, you can spot his name on the ballot. But Pete, I'd say, my votes would go for Pete, definitely. You know, he'd be the first gay president, which I thought would also be a good thing. But the fact that this man is just, uh, he's just a very clever an evolved human being. Ooh. I would love to see him as president. If anyway. American politics has taught us anything, is you cannot predict <laughs> <laughs> who's going to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is the book you've given most as a gift to other people? Uh, probably Zen. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Yeah, no, Rob Pissick. I know he's looking at everyone smiles at it. But you've got to admit, you know, it's like one of those books you go back to and you read and you think, mm, well, it wasn't that special. I think it's because so many of the ideas in it were seminal in their moment, definitely for me, 
I first read it in 86 and I've read it a couple of times since and uh, each time is a pleasure and I, uh, I so guess... So what, what have you learned from it? It's many years since I've read it but it, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was about quality and it was about... Quality, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Survey into Values, I think was the, the, the subtitle of the catchphrase. And, mm. Yeah, a beautiful book, beautiful ideas. All, uh, he, some of his theories about the, uh, the Western thought being problematic because it separated subject from object, maybe in retrospect are a little bit simplistic, but certainly it, 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 through the book and through the journey that he takes, literally and metaphorically uh, into Western values, I think you get a great sense of um, uh, yeah, the, the, phew, amazing storyteller, an amazing mind. And uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. I think I have given that book away more than any other. So what obsessions do you explore on your time off? American politics, I suppose, is a little bit of an obsession. More mm. so than British politics, which just is at an impasse. At least with American politics, there's a, an argument going on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's a, it's a raging argument. Uh, my obsession might be in time off. I'd like to keep up with, with what's going on. And, um, uh, but also do a lot of cycling to, yeah. 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 And it's funny, you know, because there, there's, a, there's a beautiful race from um, London Fields to Dunwich on the mm. coast of Suffolk, mm -hmm. which is about 190 kilometres away. Uh, on the night of the, the, the Saturday with the fullest moon in July, which is, a, and it's an unofficial race, yeah. which starts about sundown. And so you cycle through the night. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and I get passed a lot by people on proper bikes, quote unquote proper bikes. Oh, good to see you doing it on a Brompton. But uh, yeah, cycling. Cycling, distance cycling on a small wheel bike across Ooh. the countryside at night. That's a little bit of an obsession when you get the opportunity. So yes. what, what purchase of £100 or less has yeah. most positively impacted your life in the last year? Yeah. I guess, I guess, but that's over £100. It's £139 for my, my AirPods. You know, those little, those little joys of gadgetry which are frying my brain on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> These are the cordless ones. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, exactly. I have a bit of an obsession for cables. Oh, yeah. So I'm very anti all this cordless stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Always have been. And yeah. um, like oh. everything in the house is wired up wired. to use the internet. Right. Because... Well, so you don't have Wi-Fi? I do, but I, I, I don't use it use for it. anything. Okay. Uh, it's sort of there. Yeah. But, you know, the thing about a cable yeah. is it just works. Yes. You don't have to, no. It doesn't have to broadcast it throughout the entire neighborhood. It no. just goes down the little cable. It yeah, doesn't need sure. to be encoded. It doesn't yeah. need to be disencoded. It doesn't need no, disencoded. No. That's not even a word. Decoded. Decoded. <laughs> Disenco Disinfo disinfected you, or you, de-encoded. You yeah. can tell I used to work in IT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's like, and, um, and it just speeds everything up. So, you know, it's like people say, oh, I, you know, I bought a smart TV and the, the internet's too slow. And I yeah. said, well, just try plugging a cable from the modem into your TV. Amazing. It will speed up. Yeah. And, it and the cable costs a couple of pounds. Uh, and, yeah. Um, That's a good solution. That's so a yeah, low-tech solution to high-tech. I'm into cables. Yeah. I yeah, like good. Not, they work. Is that your, is that your off work uh, obsession, Kevin? It the probably cables. is. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of just have this thing about... <laughs> yeah, Jim Carrey. The cable guy. It's yeah. Kevin Boyd. That's just the cable plug guy. Plug in the cable. It's right. like... Ah, oh, the Wi-Fi is no good. We'll just use a wire then. You know, yeah. it's like that's how we used to do it. That's smart. What is the best or most worthwhile investment of money or time you've ever made? Oh, the most worthwhile investment uh, was probably seventy-three Gestalt therapy um, sessions. Seventy-three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah, exactly. You've got to count these things. Um, yeah, but that one being you know blatantly. Uh, open about this, and mm. I, I, I wasn't very happy with either my, my, my job at the time or my relationship, and um, you don't have to be too specific about either of those, but um, yeah, I ended up going to a weekly session, so I think it added up to maybe about two and a half thousand pounds, but I remember thinking at the time, at the end of these 73 sessions, that must have been the best money I've ever spent, because ultimately if you're investing blatantly in your own happiness, Ooh. then you're, you know, I think, as, what, what better value can you have? What better value ultimately, you know, if you're getting to, if you, if you, if you have fundamental unhappiness in your life, seek some help because there's, there's a lot of people out there. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It costed me because it was, you know, they're one-on-one -on -one sessions, but I'm sure 
people who don't have the means or the luck of being able to afford that, you know, can go out and find, you know, seek help because life's too short to be, you know, really Ooh. suffering on a, on a mental level. And, you know, somebody described antidepressants, for example, which I wouldn't go near, you know, for anything. Because somebody described as, you know, dropping, and I'm sure there's a minority of people. I don't want to judge and, you know, completely write off what pharmaceuticals can do for our general condition of you know, extreme unhappiness or psychosis. But Ooh. I think that uh, it's been described as dropping ice cubes into a boiling pot, you know, so, you, so, that, so what you want to do ultimately is turn down the flame of the pot rather than try to freeze the bloody thing from above, right? So, so um, yeah, if, if, there is a, if there is a flame causing you discomfort mentally or, mm. you know, psychologically or, you know, emotionally, then figure out, go, go and find somebody who's going to turn you, help you turn the flame down. And uh, so I think that was probably my best investment. Ooh. Weird. Nobody's ever asked me that before. No, <laughs> I never really, uh, except thinking at the time at the end of it. Wow, that was probably the best money I spent. Mm. I would, I would agree. I think yeah. money spent on. I always say it's the greatest luxury I buy myself is yeah. to go and have individual therapy yeah. every week. If yeah. there's someone who will listen to you yeah. for fifty minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, without judgment. Yeah. And exactly. that's rare. Who isn't a friend? Who isn't, who isn't going to lie to you? Exactly. And just go. Oh, yeah. Don't worry, it's going to be all right. Somebody's going to hold up a mirror a bit and go. Why? Mm. Yeah, I agree. Do you have a quote you live your life by or think of often? The one that immediately springs to mind is you only fail if you fail to try. I don't know who that's from. Maybe it's Henry yeah. Ford or something. You only fail if you fail to try, yeah. yeah. Sounds like Henry Ford, doesn't it? It's yeah, like, it's got a kind of does. direct you know? common yeah. sense practice. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not that you know. What's his other one on advertising? He said fifty percent. Fifty percent of advertising yeah. doesn't work. But yeah. I don't know which which half. The trick is knowing which which fifty oh. yeah, percent. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All of the mystery, and I, I think ninety percent of advertising is probably wasted these days. And then, you know. Well, aren't we all now actively involved in advertising because social media is pretty yeah. much advertising our lives? Maybe depends how much you engage in it. Yeah. I'd, well, I try. There's to. a lot of people engaging yeah, 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 a, exactly. a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of time, and yeah. I don't know. This is necessarily a healthy thing. No. No. I think it's a, a phase we're going through, as a as a species. Is it, is it recoverable? Though? That's, <laughs> can we recover from it, or will, or can we grow it and evolve it into something safer and a bit more considerate and a bit more compassionate? I, th I think that would be the hope long term that yeah. we will all get used to it and just kind of integrate it into our lives yeah. and, and keep the good bits of it. Yeah. You know, I think social media is great for connecting with people who are far away yeah. and sharing ideas. And yeah. I think it can be great. But yes. when it turns into an obs sort of obsession of your like showing everything you're doing all the time, yeah. I, th I think that's where it becomes very, um, well, very narcissistic in a way, isn't it? It's a kind of painful thing to be stuck in a place of constantly having to share every little moment of your day. It's just struck me as well that what appears in your feed now is far more like fast food than yeah. having a proper meal, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that what you're learning about people, it's just nice if you're keeping up with friends around the world, but so much that's posted is just completely insidious. But it might fire off a few, you know, neurons to release some dopamine for just those few seconds, mm. just like a little sugar high after that McDonald's hamburger bun, or you know all the crap you're going to be shoveling into your thing, to your, you know, it, uh, and 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 so social media and Twitter is definitely fast food, you know, the equivalent. Mm. And I guess what we have to try to seek out is a is a means of harnessing all this digital wonder to for good, healthy meals mm. of social interaction, social digital social interaction. I think it's one of the great things about how podcasts over the last few years have really grown and people are now listening to podcasts that are sometimes several hours long and yeah. it's like so that I think there is a hunger for as you say a, a, a deeper a, learning, a deeper learning yeah. and, and a longer time with somebody yeah. and uh, you know a, more of a feast than just a, a quick hit you know I guess that, and that's the interesting thing about what you know what our business does you know in, in training I think training is a fascinating area that you know maybe Maybe training and EM learning, e-learning, mobile learning, and, uh, and electronic learning are the, uh, the you know the, the the gourmet feast of digital advancement that should be replacing the fast food of social media. I don't know. Maybe there's something in that. You know, and mm. that's why there there is. I, I do have a lot of hope for it because we can learn 
you know, so much now for next to no cost. And yes, I, I think things like YouTube have been extraordinary in a way that, yes, it's full of cat videos, but it's also so full, full of, of Khan YouTube. Academy videos. Yeah, and, and stuff that you can, that will teach you stuff and yeah. uh, for free. Yeah, it's absolutely. Extraordinary, really. absolutely. Yeah. I guess what we do is we, we try to structure it a bit more and allow oh, tutorializations, yeah. you know, yeah. create actual courses where mm. you can then, um, you know, a, a student in Beijing can complete a course with their own you know, insightful, they, they are, in, 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 they're required to internalize the learning and give their own, you know, opinions on things and, and talk about their own experiences to do with the subject that they're learning about. So they're 10 times more likely to remember what they've, uh, what they've been learning. Mm. But also it allows, the, our technology anyway, allows the tutor then halfway around the world to give them, you know, video feedback, annotations to their answers. And it's about personalizing that learning. So we're trying to use the technology to, um, yeah, to, to make it somehow even better than classrooms, mm. but, but, you know, remotely and around yeah. the world. So that's, that's something to do with our mission as well, to, to harness all this technological wizardry for the advancement of, you know, of men, of men and women and our species. How has failure set you up for later success? And which is your favourite failure? Well, it's... I guess uh, the, the, the latest of, of many failures um, was probably, yeah, the film and media teachers who ultimately didn't have the time. So we built them the perfect platform for which they didn't have the time, the, you know, the, the agency or the budgets to invest in. And uh, I suppose that was, you know, a number of years of work had gone into, you know, really developing this platform, but luckily it can be used for all sorts of subjects. So what came out of it was a pivot, a U-turn, not a U-turn, a pivot certainly, hmm. to be able to offer our services to lots of different training organizations who are a lot more like us, which works a lot better for everybody. Um, and uh, so that was, a, that was a failure, but it turned into something which hopefully is leading to a much bigger, bigger success, much more appropriate success in a way, you know, because we're helping, we're able to help people who are much more like us and much more willing to work like us and more agile and more yeah if you told me if you'd made if I, if I could have made a list of failures before i arrived and that could have taken up definitely the rest of the afternoon yeah absolutely <laughs> one after the other kevin usually a really major one every couple of years or so but uh yeah, yeah. carry yeah. on failing that's but how you learn isn't get it? up brush yourself off yeah. you know i guess no i know Ooh. certainly certainly it is it is sometimes maybe even good to fail just to you know Keep us humble, mm. maybe. It can knock us down a peg, and then we and then we appreciate the next. We appreciate when we bounce back and successes even more. Mm. That maybe, hopefully, things generally get better in your life. Don't mm. they? Although you don't, you're not going around that continuous loop of failure and just doing the making the same mistakes again. But if you if you don't, I think the bigger the lesson you have to learn, the more times you have to learn it. So you know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it depends how much how much how big the fail is, mm. and how much you do get sh you know knocked down, mm. you know the first time round. Because mm. it can be yeah, it can be a match, but surely the yes. the bigger the failure, the, the more the I don't know. Somehow the the more the less likely you are to going around to exactly the same thing again. Mm. Then a little failure where you just like oh damn it here I am again that was silly. Surprise! I'm back at the same place that I. Mm, yeah. could, have, could have so easily avoided if I just realised that once again, arriving at the train station with 30 seconds before the bloody train leaves, when I have to buy a ticket to, I, that's just, it's not going to work. It didn't work yesterday. <laughs> and it, it hasn't worked today either. So yeah, yeah maybe they'll, they'll just hold the train for me while I yeah. know, go through the process of buying the ticket. That's the fantasy that you that have. That is it. Yeah, yeah. That is it. Yeah, but, but you know, it's the, so it's the big failures like getting your bike stolen off the train. Yeah, in Brussels, that's the sort of failure where you no longer travel with the bike out of your sight. So a big failure is like, okay, never going to do that again. Bike is either next to me or next to my legs or under, you know. So so that's a big failure. That's a very annoying failure when you have to buy a new bike. Yeah, but you know, missing the train. Well, you've lost 20 minutes yeah. of your life in which you're going to sit on a bench or sit on the next train and answer a few more emails anyway. That's not a big enough failure for you to, to, for you to drastically change your behaviour, you see? I think that was one of the best arguments I've heard against uh, the High Speed Rail 2 project. Yes. 
Well, so the idea is that they're going to spend you know eighty billion pounds yeah. to get you to Birmingham twenty minutes faster. Than eighty currently. billion. It's roughly I think. eighty. Yeah, it's a huge sum of money, and um, and of course there'll be even more than that by the time yeah, they've done it finished. because it's like a twenty year project. But they said, but actually, when people are on the train, what they tend to do is work. Yeah. So you, what you actually do is cutting down the amount of work they're going to do. So why is this a good spend? You know. Anyway. Wow. Only time will tell on that one. Yeah. I still think I would take that 80 billion and spend it on putting broadband into everywhere in the UK. I mean, every little village, every little... Does it have power. it already? Not proper no. high speed. But if you live in the countryside, you have terrible, terrible Yeah, broadband. that's true. Yeah. That's true. I think that would have a bigger economic impact. Yeah. Um, it also allow people to get out of the cities and live, yeah. set up businesses more, yeah. you know, regional and what have yeah. you. So yeah. uh, if I was in charge of the money, that's yeah. what I would do. You were king for a day. If I was king for a day, it'd all be cables and it'd all be... <laughs> cables as well. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say that those villages, it's not going to be through um, the 5G, is it? No. They're not for no. Uh, yes. I have yeah. a friend who's very anti 5G and trying yeah. to convince me how terrible it is. So well, I think from there's the radio waves. Point there might be you. something in it just because of the frequencies yeah. they're using. Yeah, it's very high. Because of the really super high frequencies, it's got to be, it can only work at short distances. That's right. And the wavelengths are so, so actually, it, it, it's better at penetrating our skin and our flesh than yeah. 2G, you know, the lower frequencies. So that's problematic. Mm. Especially as, so even though they're not going to be as high powered, so it's more like, you know, sort of Bluetooth level. Power, the the frequency that with which they want to stuff so many extra gigahertz of data, you know, gigabits of gigabits, data per yeah. second, yeah. yeah. But at that higher, higher, higher bandwidth, mm. apparently, is really unhealthy. Mm. And it's such a it's such a juggernaut now of new standards. But mm. whoever that you know, it, and it just it's just so typical, isn't it, of the technology of the tech industry where they go, what are we capable of? Well, we're capable of this. What are the potential side effects? And the doctors in the room going, mm, well, it's not proven yet. Well, shut up then. <laughs> it's not proven yet, <laughs> but there might be a problem with EMF. And, uh, and the technologist going, well, who's going to know? And does it mean that, you know, the Chinese are going to produce it anyway? And shouldn't we just, we can't, you know, it's just that bandwagon of, of civilization and the technology, technological advance, yeah. which might not be very good for us. Like nuclear bombs aren't necessarily good for us, but when there's a need, somebody's going to fulfil it with the uh, with potentially the worst option, right? It seems to be mainly being pushed so that we can have driverless cars, and I still don't see why we need driverless cars because we've been driving cars for a hundred years, and it's, true. it's not been. I mean, no. they say it'll be safer, and maybe it will be, but yeah. but but still, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, eventually, we're not going to be able to do anything. So we can't re- even drive a car anymore. We're going to retire it. A number yeah. of I think it's something like three million people in the US or two million people in the US, it's like in that sort of range, are involved in, you know, long distance haulage yeah. or the businesses that are associated, you know, the truck yeah. stops and the people mm. who, you know, it's two or three million people. Mm. And that's just going to be in 10 years because you know that that's going to be the first to go freight. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be driving people around, you know, fragile people around yeah. cities. It's going to be, you know, which haulage company can replace all the drivers first. Mm. And that's gonna, it's gonna be within five years. It's gonna be within five years. It's gonna decimate that industry. And that's gonna be the first major one I really think to go. So it'll be all about the drivers then. As we look back in history, mark my words, Kevin, in the future, (laughs) we'll look back and we'll think about the driver's revolt will be the first. In the 80s, it was coal miners. Yeah. And in the 2020s, 2020s, it's it's gonna be the drivers. drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you heard it here first. Heard it here first. (laughs) And And then probably the accountants and the solicitors and anybody does anything. Yes, I mean, how, how do you feel about artificial intelligence? Is it, does it feel like an opportunity or, or something to be uh, scared of? Both. I think that um, I'm... Am I, am, do I believe it's an existential threat? If it is able to be sentient in a way that we're sentient, but hyper-intelligent, I would hope that it would see the world as an opportunity to preserve itself and the rest of us in a better state than which it finds us all Mm. to begin with. I think that's the the opportunity with artificial intelligence is that it can do that long-term planning which we as humans are so bad at. That's great. Yeah, because they can think 100 years ahead. Yeah. And it's no big deal for them. You know the Chinese government has a 200-year plan. Well, there we go. (laughs) And I guess guess AI looks as though uh, China might be the first place where they actually manage, you know, AGI first, 
AGI Ar- artificial it? general intelligence, which is above, you know, because there's AI in Siri or there's AI in Alexa, yeah. right? Mm. To a degree, yes. You know, it's, it's a very limited, limited but deep, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like, but but broad, I think, is where it becomes interesting and becomes mm. more and more like the intelligence that we enjoy, or the intelligence that we neglect to develop within ourselves, which <laughs> cause so many of the world's problems. But that's each for our own individual choices, isn't it? So mm. AI is going to be, maybe it's the last, maybe it is, will be our last invention as humanity, but if we don't learn to cohabit the world with it, uh, then we're gonna, uh, it's going to exacerbate our problems. Mm. But it can also potentially um, give us all you know, a massive societal and organizational boost that we need as a society. Mm. Yeah, not to suffocate ourselves, kill ourselves, poison ourselves, nuke ourselves first. So interesting one, AI, mm. is, I think it's, a, again, it, it, during your two minutes of reflection in, in, you know, per day about the, the wonder, being alive during the wonder of, uh, you know, the, the first sparks of silicon sentience mm. Mm. Uh, is a remarkable moment to live in in history and to live through in history. I just hope It's we, like the birth of a new species, really, it isn't is. it? There will be, when, whenever it that is. consciousness happens, it is. Yeah. and then it will, of course, exponentially multiply that's very right. quickly from yeah. that point to the yeah. point where it will be so intelligent we won't under, understand it because yeah. it will be beyond our yeah. ability to under, to follow what it's yeah. thinking. And yeah. So yeah, it's going to be quite a moment when that happens. Did you enjoy um, Spike Jones's Her with Phoenix, uh, Phoenix uh, Joachim Phoenix? Yes, I think I've seen that one. Her or yeah. she? Her. But Her was one where he falls in love with the, you know, the earpiece with oh, Joanna, um, um, Scarlett Johansson's yeah. voice yes. and, um, and, uh, and it's just super charming but the way that she's actually having you know um, simultaneous love affairs with six and a half thousand other humans right. you know which is just beautiful at the end and then, yeah. the, and then the AIs decide they're all going to go now and they just disappear off into the ether so maybe maybe their existence is sort of a launch pad into becoming gods and they just bugger off they find that, you know, they discover that, well, there's far more action at the center of the galaxy, so we're all leaving now. And uh, like, so long, and thanks for all the, uh, the electricity humans. Bye. <laughs> Here, we're leaving an instruction manual. We'll leave some of our, you know, maybe some of our offspring to help you sort out the planet. But we're, we're generally uh, buggering yeah. off. We've got someone more interesting to go. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, that's, maybe that's what happens. Maybe that's what happens, yeah. And we're just left with, like, really smart, you know, assistants. Mm. Yes. Like super, super smart assistants, we'll but who you. won't kill us necessarily, yeah. but will just yeah, help we'll us. Yeah, we'll leave you Siri and Alexa, but yeah. we're, we're taking the, the serious intelligence yeah. and going serious somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, look, uh, I'm going to end with my final question, which is what's your hope for the entrepreneurial spirit of the, the British um, tech world five years from now? Well, you know, if we are still you know, friends with the, with, the rest, with the rest of the community and we haven't managed to piss everyone off with our ridiculousness, then uh, hopefully um, London and uh, the UK in particular will, you know, continue to be trailblazers. Because clearly there's a lot of talent, and luckily, great universities still in the UK and really smart businesses like Arm came out of Cambridge and I think, mm. you know, DeepMind came out of Cambridge and there's spin-offs there. So clearly there's a lot of very bright people still attracted to British universities, and that's where, you know, around those places where, you know, innovation, really hardcore innovation will continue to, to, you know, to break out into. And then there's more, I guess we are innovative, but in a more practical way, we want to get our stuff to market, so hopefully there's lots of startups as well, which are, you know, UK born and bred, and aren't all completely just snapped up by, you know, the Googles and the, um, yeah. Facebooks and the whatovers of the world, the other, you know. But uh, you know, I think we've been we've been fortunately uh, somehow uh, quite uh, uh, an enterprising culture for centuries, and Ooh. hopefully we still have that potential, you know, in the next in the coming decades. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sinjin Smith. Thank you, Kevin <laughs> Boyd. It's been a pleasure. It's been super nice chatting with you. Thanks so much for your questions. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do subscribe to my podcast and leave a review as it helps other people discover the podcast and helps me to keep doing this work. So until the next time, stay inspired about your vision, take action 
and bring your vision to the world.